Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the CG Pro live stream. You are live, unless you're listening to the recording, that is. So, yeah, welcome. Great to have you all here. And we're going to go through, uh, in a second, what we're going to go through tonight. We'll be talking about ICVFX and being a tech artist. And we have the amazing Scott Rosecrantz with us here tonight. Scott, great to have you here. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Good to see everyone once again. You bet. You bet. So let us jump into it. We have an hour and we're going to fill it full as, as full as we can of great information about the virtual production industry, about being a tech artist, and let us get straight into that. So I'm going to share the screen. There we go. Um, and yeah, Scott, you are the the lead instructor for the class that we run, but you're also the lead for the session tonight. So I'm going to let you uh, take it away and um, I will be here as well. So this is going to be a, an interactive session between me and Scott. We'll, <clears throat> we'll be talking through the <clears throat> material we've got for tonight. We'll be, it's very much a conversation for us, but it's also a conversation for you all out there. So if you have questions, please feed them into whichever platform you're in, whether it's Twitch, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Um, we will take questions throughout. So uh, please do send us questions whenever they come up. And we'll also have a little bit of QA time at the end. But um, yeah, Scott, let's take it away. Yeah, thanks. And like I said, it, it, it's good to be here again. This is this will be, I think, the fifth time I've taught this course, or, the, or the, we together have gone through all of this. And uh, and it just makes sense. This is one of those types of topics where um, it makes sense to revisit it and revisit the material uh, every time we we te we do this. We have some of these sessions because uh, it changes quite a lot. This is, you know, I used to teach uh, character rigging at Noman. I spent a lot of years at Noman and um, Character rigging is, you know, it's it's the intro and at least it, the early advanced stages of character rigging that's pretty stable. It's not really changing a lot. And uh, if I were to go back, it's been about four years since I taught at Gnome. And if I were to go back and teach character rigging again, guaranteed it would be the same content. It would be the same, you know, 10 weeks of character rigging structure that we've got there. This is very different. This is still you know, four or five years old. And, and for some people, you know, there's there's been facets of this that's been in the um, in the mainstream for quite some time now. But um, yeah, as it exists in its current form, it's been changing and evolving. And so it makes sense to come back. And it's actually kind of it, it's a very challenging course to teach because of that. It's, you know, I'm constantly refreshing my materials, having to go back and recreate new versions of these slides and new versions of the uh, the information that we're sharing. There's new technologies, new workflows that are being developed all the time. And so, yeah, just doing a little check in to make sure that we're still up to date with the latest, um, you know, stuff and information that's available out there and share that with you guys as well, guys and gals out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully get you interested enough to uh, take the plunge. And so that's sort of what we're doing here tonight is just going through, you know, focusing on the the course and the materials for the course um in terms of you know what what we cover throughout the six week course here and just kind of do a refresher of these sort of terms and you know the foundation and the roles on the job because again they're they're evolving they're changing all the time and so ed unless you have anything to add to it i think i'll just go into what we're going to cover tonight all right um yeah so it's it's so we're going to start off by talking about you know it, I don't want to say my definition of virtual production, but as a virtual production supervisor, I deal with, you know, it. it I see it being narrowed into a, a very small subset of a, a tiny window put into a box a lot of the times. And so defining what, you know, uh, a virtual production can be because it is many more than just LED walls, many more things. Um, and then uh, talking about the the foundations, the skills that you're going to need. So I'm going to define, you know, all the sort of different types of things you can do with virtual production, what counts as virtual production, and then talk about the skills that you would need to be, you know, trained up in. Um, it, it's not just necessarily like, you know, all unreal all the time. So uh, talk about some of the skills that are needed there and then talk about the different roles, the different jobs that have kind of come about over the past few years, um, either working on the box or live on set. Uh, there's a lot of different a lot of growth in this space and a lot of interest in this space and it can be a little bit overwhelming and people don't necessarily know 
you know, what to, to learn or, you know, what kind of job they're going to be doing when they're done learning. Like it's, it's hard to know. You're trying to figure out a, what interests you, uh, and B what, you know, can also be, uh, uh, you know, keep you engaged and also, you know, obviously make money at the end of the day. That's why we're all here. Right. Um, and so going over the different types of jobs that you can be, find yourself in after you've completed a course like this. And then I'm going to really get down into the nuts and bolts of the course and talk about our six week syllabus and give you exactly, you know, bullet point for bullet, bullet point, what we will be covering in um, the next six weeks of this course, which I think starts next week, if I'm not mistaken, Ed, it's June the 10th or yep. a week or two away from now, uh, which is great. So, um, you know, trying to get everybody excited. Let me know if you have any questions and we'll um, revisit everything at the end. All right, just a quick intro for myself, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting me. I'm just kidding. Um, I am a Unreal Authorized Instructor. Thank you, Ed and uh, CG Pro for, for making that happen and encouraging me to go through and get that authorization. Um, it was very stressful, but also awesome. And uh, and, and I've, I've never stopped learning. That's That's been kind of set me on that course to like, all right, teaching Unreal has kept me on a course of constantly learning Unreal. And so I can't really just sort of uh, sit back and be a supervisor. I have to kind of learn all the tr the tricks and the the craft that uh, in order to be able to teach it to you guys as well. So um, keeping me fresh. Uh, so, but I've been working at Zoic Studios for 15 years. Uh, I've been a CG supervisor for the majority of that time. I also do some visual effects supervision. I go out to set. Uh, I work on a lot of episodic TV shows, commercials, game trailers. We're working on a few features. Um, like I said, I taught at rigging for a little while and I, I've been doing virtual production at Zoic for, for quite some time now. Um, and that, you know, that, that role virtual production supervisor role is like I was saying, it's very kind of fluid. I don't necessarily, I'm not in a, an led volume every day. I don't go out to set every day. Um, I, I, we do a lot of virtual production that involves a lot of the things we're going to talk about tonight, all the vizs, post vis, pre vis and things like that. Uh, and we're also delivering a lot of final pixels uh, renders. It, it's it's been interesting to see the evolution. Again, uh, we started off, you know, in, in visual effects for 10 or 15 years. All we did was deliver frames. That was our product, right? The product was a two-dimensional picture that in a stack of those goes over to the client. They ship it out to the world. Uh, but now it's uh, it's I've been delivering Unreal levels. I've been delivering game scenes and things like that. And so. We've been doing a lot of um, AR work and things like that, virtual production work, and so the the not only the type of you know work that we're doing, but also the deliveries we've been uh, have been evolving as well. We've done a lot of um, you know uh, virtual production, the traditional you know quote unquote traditional virtual production stuff. We've shot a few commercials in the volume. We've done a lot of AR work with uh, a uh, the famous group, which is an agency uh, in the LA area. We've done work with the NFL, the PGA, ESPN, the NBA. Uh, we helped Universal Studios get their LED volume up and running. We were doing some test shoots with the Fast and Furious. Uh, TV shows like um, Sweet Tooth. We did some very early um, LED volume work down in uh, New Zealand when they were on full lock. You know, the rest of the world was on full lockdown and COVID. And New Zealand was uh, the first backup and shooting production there. We were doing virtual production remotely. Um, that was extremely challenging and difficult. And then we've also worked a lot with uh, Fox Sports to do some of their um, their live green screen, and now they they have a lot of um, uh, you know huge LED volumes and a lot of uh, amazing work that they do over there at Fox Sports, and so providing them a lot of stuff. So that's been some of the more recent work that I've done, but I've got a you know like I said an extensive background uh, doing lots of of different type of stuff. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Ed, I'll let him sort of introduce himself. He will be here as well uh, throughout part of the course, popping in and out. I will. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Um, so. Name's Ed Dawson Taylor. I have been a several things. I was a software engineer originally, and then became a visual effects artist about fifteen years ago. Um, I, when I first came to America, I went to work at Zoic Studios, and Scott was my supervisor. So it's really awesome to be be able to work with Scott again in this capacity. Um, I'm co-founder of CG Pro. I did. A bunch of things since uh, I've worked at Zoic. Work went on to work on some of the formative virtual production movies, such as Jungle Book and Lion King, that helped kind of pave the way for using game engines in filmmaking. Um, 
among other things, worked at DD and ILM and various studios like that. I was very lucky to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so just really these days, it, it gives me great pleasure to be able to be a teacher. It's a tremendous gift being able to be a teacher and helping serve the community. Um, we were, the, I think, the first school to teach film and virtual production using Unreal Engine. Uh, and yeah, since the last two and a half years of the school's existence, um, we've grown substantially. And I'm really just uh, happy to be able to facilitate things like this because I love this subject and I'm still active and out on stages and uh, but teaching is a, a real passion, so it's a pleasure to be here. But uh, tonight's not about me, so I'm I'm going to pass it back to Scott. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and and yeah, it's it has been very cool and very fun to be, you know, out there teaching this stuff. When early on, when it definitely felt like we did not know enough to <laughs> to to be responsible for informing other people of this stuff, but 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 it definitely grew along with the industry over the past couple of years, and uh, we definitely feel like we've hit our stride. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about the virtual production and how sort of we define it, right? Because like I said, there is you know, the, the huge, um, you know, buzzword of the the now is the LED volumes, right? But that's not where it sort of ends. So it's a huge part of it, sure, but that's not um, the full picture. So I've got a, a bit of a a sort of a, I'm a list guy, and and Ed is a flowchart guy. So we've got a, we've got a little bit of both going on tonight. So you'll see a lot of the same information both in list form and flowchart form. So. Um, we try to cater to both types of um, uh, the audience there. But uh, starting with a quote here, this came out of the virtual production handbook itself. And forgive me for reading verbatim, but virtual production is an all-encompassing set of techniques that begin in development and can be used all the way through the final product. It's a bridge between the physical and virtual worlds. Uh, another critical aspect is the development of reusable assets throughout the production process, underscore that whole line. Uh, and the traditional segmentation of filmmaking labor into pre-production, production, and post-production phases transforms into a continuous workflow. So what that sort of says, I love that quote, uh, you know, that definition, because it, it sort of, it, it's three sentences that really gets at the heart of, you know, it's, it's it feels like it's larger than the sum of its parts, right? So it's that the, those words, all encompassing set of techniques. I mean, that's, it really is. And, and, and it's felt like it, and it hasn't felt like it has been. So what I've experienced over the course of teaching this class is, is a very even mix of people coming from production and people coming from either visual effects games or a CG sort of VFX background, right? I've, I, I've started off when we were creating this course, it was very difficult to try to like, okay, do we lean into the Unreal stuff because we got people in production that are really interested in learning Unreal or do we lean into the, um, the, the live action the, the you know sort of teaching the the set and the volume type of things because you know there's people coming from visual effects that are going to be working on set for their very first time and so it was you know and we, it ended up we have a very even mix almost every single class there's a very even mix of people that are coming from either world um, as well as the the newbies people that are completely um, you know just taking the plunge right out of the gate and um, that and co commending it's a very commendable uh thing to do very brave people and uh we kudos to them and we help them um as much as we can along the way be those people that have taken say the intro course from you know uh the connectors program that cg pro offers and then dive right into this and keep the momentum going from those intro classes uh we, we you know we will get you both geared up with all this, the info you need to know for the unreal side of things and the live actions you know working on set side of things because um, like I said, we've we've found that we've had to kind of um, cater to both of those those specialties, um, and but that that really does it, it, you kind of have to because that's sort of like the that that's the work right there is you're you're bringing these two worlds together. You're doing live action stuff and in and visual effects at the same time. You're bringing the post into the pre and all that stuff. That doesn't mean post goes away. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So like that that basically means it takes. You know, instead of segmenting everything into production and post-production, your traditional sort of, uh, you know, timeline for, for you know, um, creating content, then we're, we're now mixing it into this one big bag. All of these, all of these um, different uh, workflows are, they're talking to each other, right? And so we, we break it down. And again, this is one of those things that's always evolving, it's always changing and stuff, but where it's sort of kind of been, we've found some dividing lines here is that we break it down into the pre, uh, which 
you know, comprises itself of the visualization, or we call it the vizs, the uh, the the previs, the postvis, techvis, virtual scouting. So previs, uh, I'll, I'll just start getting into this and breaking these down one by one, right? So the under the visualization tent, we've got our previs artist, and that's you know sort of that's you're you're taking uh, what traditional previs was you know the same idea except now it, you're no longer building previs for uh, at you know very quick turnarounds throwaway work it used to be we would just load a bunch of stuff into maya half of it was gray shaded half of it was just a blend shader a lambert shader or whatever and they would just do the bare minimum to get the point across a little bit above storyboards and then it didn't matter what it looked like. It was just a giant mess. It was a you know Miocene that nobody could use, uh, and you would throw it away when you're done. Nowadays, previs is is the foundational cornerstone of the rest of the production pipeline, right? Especially when we we talk about these virtual production things, previs is the thing that you're you know we're building that everyone else is going to build on top of. We are no longer throwing away these previs scenes in Unreal. We are using this all the way to the very end. A lot of the times I'm doing final pixel renders for shows like I've done for All Mankind uh, and a bunch of other TV shows recently, um, the peripheral and things like that, where we are, our uh, Citadel was another one we just recently delivered. We're, del we're rendering the backgrounds out of the Unreal Engine. And a lot of those scenes, there are elements inside of those final renders that started in our previous scenes, right? And so, um, you know, that's that's where the whole thing kind of begins. We've been putting a lot more effort into making our previs look and and perform to a quality standard, right? So previs no longer looks like it used to, um, and it's not really considered as like it used to be. It, it, it takes a little bit more time. We put a little bit more passion and love into that previs. Um, and so then we've got our post viz, which is, you know, for us at least, that's, you know, that you'll find a few different answers for what post viz is, but, uh, but this is where we have been starting to um, integrate the principal photography uh, along with our previs, right? And so let's say we would have a previs, uh, and you know we're maybe using metahumans to block out a scene, right? So then we would go out, or the production team would go out, and they would shoot some green screen elements. They would have two people on a green screen doing some dialogue, and as opposed to our metahumans where it was in previs, they're now we now have green screens, right? So we would uh, instead of you know the traditional visual effects pipeline of slowly ingesting all those plates and rendering out temporary backgrounds and doing slap comps and things like that. Now we're taking that that footage directly into Unreal Engine and we are you know pulling green screen keys inside the engine and providing those plates spitting those back out and that goes right back over to the production team to the editorial team and they are getting their temp edits built. They're working with this footage that is you know, unreal backgrounds over, you know, on, underneath uh, the, the green screen plates, principal photography uh, to create their edit. And they're, they're, be, they're able to get into that, those, those flame sessions, the DaVinci sessions, whatever they're, you know, using to build their edits with their creatives much, much sooner and with much higher quality levels of sort of temp things. And so that's where you answer a lot of questions, really. There's things that like, you know, about the background and lighting and direction of lights and things like that, that you could never really used to be able to get into until you were well into version three, four, 10, 15 or whatever of your, your V-Ray renders or your Arnold renders. Um, there were things that you just couldn't see in that temporary delivery uh, that you're now able to see. And so the, the director's seen it at the post biz level they're signing off on things they can leave and go work on another project and they know that that final version that's coming over is going to look pretty much like the version they saw in post viz and so that post viz has become very very important um to to you know cementing this whole process and it really that's where the the cost savings is that's where you're you know cutting down on on post production iteration and you know it, you're saving money on the as the visual effects studio you're saving money as a client um, you know, getting this this information upfront and getting it all approved much earlier, right? Uh, so moving on to TechViz, we, that's you know, uh, this is where we we go through that that previs stage and before you go to your principal photography shoots, you we do a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what are they called? The um, help me out here. The the third uh, third party third eye renders here. Um, brain farting on the term all of a sudden, but um, we're rendering out the the play blasts or the um, you know the footage, the previs from a another camera viewport there that allows you to see where the camera 
should be placed and we're giving information like lens, uh, camera height, the pitch, the angle of the camera, uh, you know, any, any, any information that can be helpful uh, for the people on, on set. Um, we're giving things like uh, uh, speed. I, I have a speedometer blueprint now for, for, we've done a lot of cars and buses and just different vehicles, planes and things like that, that they're shooting that they, that they need to know when they're, you know, they get our previs. Um, and, and so I'm going to back up a little bit. We've done a lot of shows where, you know, we either have COVID protocols, which those are going away. Great. But we still have a lot of shows that are shooting in, in, you know, internationally, right? A lot of the production is being done internationally. Um, we have a show going on right now that is being shot in the, um, the far East. And, uh, there's not a lot of English spoken. There's only a couple of people on set. So there's a you know you have a lot of translation issues there. So sending over the tech viz and and we you know we prevised out entire sequences that we would normally not even do previs for just simple dialogue shots and things like that. But it was so helpful. They found it so helpful to see the you know the 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 lens, the length of the lens, you know uh, the the height of the camera, the angle of the camera, the speed of every, everything, and they were able to match what we were doing shot for shot for shot because without you know the the audio language they were able to speak the same visual language they were able to look at the previs and see in the tech viz the numbers that they should be matching to and they were able to match to it and if you look at our final renders versus our previs it is almost frame for frame and it is uh it's amazing to kind of see that the information actually be used you know because a lot of the times like i said this stuff was just throwaway work right uh, and so then, yeah, we, and then we've got our virtual scouting, which is part of the previs process where you're on with the clients, either in a Zoom call in an Unreal scene or in a headset, if you're lucky enough to have uh, a client or people that you're working with that are advanced enough technology-wise um, to be able to jump into a headset and do those types of sessions with you, right? And so those that's, that's a lot of, you know, work uh, that, that happens in that visualization process. That's normally on the box. You don't necessarily have to be on set to do a lot of this stuff. Some of that is, right? And so then we get into, you know, your performance stuff. We've got some, some motion capture that's, you know, that's been changing a lot as well. I have another class, we talk about animation. Um, you know, the motion capture stuff is moving very quickly into the AI side of things. And we're doing a lot of things with, um, you know, move AI and all the different uh, ways that you can take video and translate that to motion capture. Um, it's, it's great. It's amazing. It's a, a evolving every day, and that's wonderful. But you still need some somebody to clean that up. It's not perfect, right? And mocap never was, right? So you need, there's always somebody that needs to sort of fix the data, not only know how to shoot it properly, but also fix it and clean up the data that you get back. Same with facial animation. The facial capture software that we have with the Live Link stuff is amazing, and it gets you a lot for free but it also takes you about 80 85 percent if you dial it in really well you really still need to have somebody on the on you know doing some manual overrides there to kind of take that last 15 percent and make it look and really sing um same you know we've got some animation and stuff virtual cameras works in in this performance space as well so that's sort of the pre side of our virtual production definition uh then we jump into the production side of things we've got you know, your live green screen stages. I mentioned Fox Sports earlier. They used to have, um, you know, this huge, massive green screen volume for their NASCAR studio that we did a lot of uh, content for. Um, you know, Weather Channel, news stations, you name it. There is a huge industry built around these live green screen um, productions. And, uh, you know, it's the, the space is massive. The, the broadcast space is is booming right now. And uh, the, you, you wouldn't think, but it surprise it is and there's a lot of a lot of interest in it a lot of people are getting into it epic has shown a huge interest in this there's a lot of software being developed for it um there used to be only a few uh software packages available for doing this type of work now there's a ton and they're all working with the ar mixed reality the xr extensions things like that um and so there's a whole subset I mean, it's it's very easy to put it into two bullet points here but it is a you know there's a lot that goes underneath those two bullet points uh, and then same follows true for the ICV effects, right? The in-camera visual effects. This is your LED volumes and LED screens. I split the two here because there is a difference and you're starting to see, you know, a specific type of work go to 
uh, you know, smaller stages, flatter screens that are more modular and you can rip off and sort of move these around. These are these car process shots. Um, we have studios like the uh, Magic Box that has, you know, an 18 wheeler that with with screens inside of it that are very mobile and modular and you can move them around. But their their specialty is that sort of car process shots or, you know, smaller sort of uh, volumes that you can set up and be working with very quickly on the fly. Um, and then you've got your volumes that that have, you know, those the ones we've all seen that they they get all the press, right? The LED volumes that have the, 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 the very large expansive spaces and the very impressive scenes inside of those that need to be performing at, you know, a thousand frames per second, uh, very highly optimized. And these are, you know, they're they're amazing, but they are very, very different workflows. And so that that didn't always used to be the case. When we started this class, it was LED was LED, right? And now we're starting to see classifications of LED workflows sneak into place. And so there's different approaches if you're going to these sort of different types of uh, setups, right? And so we talk about that in the class. We talk about, you know, how you would approach a scene for a specific type of job. Uh, and then we, we have do, a, sorry, go ahead. We have a, yeah, no worries. We have a couple of questions that are probably uh, relevant to the section you're talking about right now. Um, sure. So I just want to bring them up. Um, somebody asked, uh, curious what Scott's go-to platform for green screen and AR shoots is, preferred platform for LED shoots, disguise and display, Pixotope, et cetera. Ah, I don't want to play favorites, uh, <laughs> but I also, so like that where my role personally has been over the past few years has been a content provider for a lot of these, um, uh, you know, industries. And so uh, the I, I provide content for studios and, and clients that have, I've worked with all of them. We've got Zero Density, Pixitope, Disguise as as uh, vendors on all of our clients, uh, different, different clients. And so um, I can't say for sure which one is, so they all do various you know, takes on the same sort of thing, and they all do a very good job. I personally have seen a lot more of disguise in use, if that says anything. Um, as I travel around and visit different stages in the area, I have seen a lot more um, sort of, I've seen some very impressive hands-on stuff myself with disguise. Uh, Pixitope and Stipe and a lot of the, uh, in Zero Density, they all do very impressive work as well. So they're all, they're all really good. I would have to say, and this is completely subjective. Uh, if I were to take a course to pick up, you know, one of these these uh, green screen things, and I know a little bit about all of them, the concepts are all there. But if I had to really dive down and get like, all right, I want to learn ins and outs, nitty gritties of all this stuff, I would take a disguise course. But again, that's just me. Um, they all, they all, and we do have, um, if I may, we have a lot of uh, of guest speakers that come into the class uh, every week, you know, uh, on Tuesday nights for our office hours, we have a different um, guest speaker that I would consider a celebrity in the industry. Um, and one of them being um, Alex, uh, oh God, I'm blanking on his last name right now, Alex Z, um, but he, he's a Pix, yes, thank you, Zambrano, thank you. Um, he is a Pixitope specialist. And so he does come in and he, he lays the groundwork for us and goes over a lot of those, those core concepts and, and shows us how Pixitope works at sort of a granular level. Um, and so, yeah, there is an opportunity to see, you know, and learn a lot of that stuff as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, was there another question? There was, yep. Um, somebody also asking, I'm curious how much of the course would be applicable for someone who's already several years into being a tech artist but wants to get to expert level? Ah. So yes, that is that's another one of those challenges where I was, you know, I was mentioning earlier. Do I cater to uh, people coming from the tech world or the the live events world or people coming from the visual effects world? And it's kind of, you know, I kind of have to cater to everybody, right? I have to I, I try to give everyone special treatment, right? Um, so I, I cast a wide net, and so yeah, with the you know, I try to make sure that I I slow down and I explain the concepts well enough that someone a beginner can understand them. And, and get up to speed. Um, but I do cover, you know, so uh, I go as far as I can into like advanced uh, workflows uh, and especially when it comes to things inside of the engine, right? Cause that's sort of where my my day-to-day uh, -day work lives. And so the VAD work, the optimization work, um, and and then, you know, we, we do a lot of, you know, gear talk and tech talk 
with uh, workflows and and you know doing demos and things like that. Or like we we go over switchboard and end display at, at quite length, quite great length. And so we talk about that and we do you know hands on work. I get you guys up and running um, with your own version of end display and have it have you launch it yourself in your own home in one form or the other. Um, but then uh, uh, we do also go out to a stage visit. I think that's where the real, you know, true power of this is, is that we, we, you know, we rent out a stage for a day as part of this class and we get everyone that can make it to LA um, to, to visit that stage out early in the course and to get hands-on experience with that, to ask all those questions, get to that expert level. Um, and, and we used to actually, we tweaked the class. This is part of our learning process. We tweaked the course. It used to be, uh, we would do all of the learning six weeks and then we would go out after the fact and visit the this stage um, and we found that there was a lot of comments about like i would i wish we'd have done this earlier i would have asked more about this technique or this piece of gear or i wanted to know more about such and such and so we've tweaked it so now the the stage visit happens after week three it's dead center in the middle of class so that you get that hands-on experience there may not be there, there will be things that you do not understand when you visit the stage, but that's sort of the point. It gives you time, three more weeks with myself and whoever else, um, to ask those questions, to really dr drill down into those specifics of anything that kind of piques your interest or something you didn't, you saw that uh, on stage that you didn't quite understand. And and so yeah, we we I push as far as I can to quote unquote expert, but you know I've got a little bit of imposter syndrome myself, so that word expert I just feel weird saying it. <laughs> we all we all got that and i think it's worth worth mentioning and i i do this stuff too and we we teach other classes and teach to a broad a broad range one of the things that really helps with that with our school is that this is all taught live uh so we are able to adjust and adapt depending on mm -hmm. the audience which is something that's kind of tricky if it's video based um, because it's live we can um adapt and we're also because we have live labs at the end of class and during class and in the lab session and we have a an active forum where you can ask questions offline it really helps us to tune the the training to different levels that's something that we've been really careful to do for all our classes um, so yeah just worth mentioning that cool I'm going to move on real quick. We can uh, hit some more questions at the end. Great questions, guys. Keep them coming. So thank you. Um, we have uh, the roles we were talking about here, the the CG. This is where we're starting to get into more traditional visual effects, where you're integrating your CG elements. Sometimes we're rendering backgrounds out of Unreal, uh, providing those to compositors to integrate. Sometimes we're rendering foregrounds, right? They, the CG elements, whether that be uh, VFX, like uh, smoke and magic stuff, or characters. We're doing a lot of characters in Engine now and developing and pushing that. I mean, you can still do that traditionally as well. Houdini and Maya are not gone. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting trying to see how far we can push the engine and integrate it just like any other software. And I, you know, I know there's more studios that are doing this type of work now, not just Zoic. I mean, I, I give Zoic a lot of credit because I worked there for one and I pushed very hard to get uh, our, our studio to use this as early as we can as a traditional visual effects software. Um, but yeah, we're not the only ones doing it now. The other studios are, I won't say playing catch up because they were probably doing it the same time we were. We were all jumping in. Um, I like to feel like we were special. But uh, yeah, there's well, a lot you, of- You are, I think. I mean, I would say <laughs> Zoic is, you are and Zoic is, you know, Zoic have been arguably doing virtual production for as long as I've known them. And I've been here for, for 11 years. When I first encountered Zoic, they were using the Zoo system, which was a yep. early virtual camera system. Yeah, the camera tracking. 10 our... plus years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were so. the, the camera tracking stuff that you see in LED volumes now. We didn't have 15 different tracking volume or vendors to choose from. We had to make our own. Um, but yeah, that's that sort of it comes along with the uh, be working in television. I think episodic television has very tight schedules, very tight budgets, and so it sort of breeds this this sort of uh, uh, you know flexibility and willingness to 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 jump into anything that's going to be cost saving, performance saving, time saving, and so we 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 kind of have to, right? Um, and it and good for us. The Unreal is you know amazing enough to kind of respond to the those pressures. Um, so, 
Uh, and then, yeah, so the ICB effects side of things, the, not only uh, uh, the onset work, but we do traditional visual effects work to it after the fact. We The first one we did, the first visual, virtual production show, was a commercial for uh, Gundam. And every single shot, there was probably 30 shots that we did that all had magical little UIs floating uh, that had to be tracked in after the fact. We were still doing traditional visual effects to it, right? So motion design, motion graphics, all that stuff had to be done. Um, as well. So um, here's a, a nice little flow chart provided by uh, Epic Games, uh, their virtual production field guide, sort of the same deal. I was just talking about all this stuff that you got your, you know, that your creative comes in, you sometimes get a script, sometimes you don't. This pitch biz, this is sort of, you know, I didn't list it out here, but that is, you know, um, it, it is a skill set in itself, right? This pitch biz, uh, because and I didn't list it out because it's not necessarily, we don't hire people for this role specifically, but we could. If we get enough, you know, I think work and traction in this space, you can start to see this develop because, you know, where uh, storyboards and, and concept art used to exist in their sort of world, you're seeing the, the intrusion of AI into this space. And so, but even without the AI, we were doing this sort of stuff. Sometimes we get uh, scripts that's it. We only get a script and we would do our own pitch biz. This would be up to the supervisor or the creative director. We would do, um, you know, our own concept work, our own storyboards, but we weren't using, you know, traditional techniques. We were jumping into the Unreal Engine and kit bashing things and taking screenshots and doing storyboards that way, you know, using the mannequin or whatever and being like, all right, here's a truck, here's two mannequins. They're doing a fight sequence and we're taking screenshot, screenshot, screenshot and taking that. Uh, creating our own storyboard, sending that to the client to get buy off on that type of stuff. So it could, you know, be its own sort of role, um, you know, with a dedicated artist to it. But yeah, you are starting to see that this is the lines are getting blurred a little bit between traditional pitch and, you know, what's now happening. Um, art department previs, virtual art department, visual effects, all kind of work together, whether they're in UE5 or not. You've got your asset creation, which is more and more looking like it's, you know, coming from Unreal. I'm loving the stuff I'm seeing. I saw a post the other day with Unreal 5.3 has uh, skinning. You can do, you can paint skin weights inside of Unreal now. One more, one more thing to keep us from having to go over to Maya. Um, you know, they're copying Maya. So kudos to Maya for having the best paint weight program for 20 something years. But, um, but yeah, it, it'd be, it's great to just have one location to do all of your work. Uh, anyways, stunt viz, pre viz, tech viz, all of this stuff happens sort of, you know, simul fluidly, simultaneous and fluid. Like you're jumping back and forth between a lot of this stuff. And then you've got your principal photography, however that is approached. And then, you know, your traditional sort of pipeline spits out of there. I've, you can move this stuff around a million different ways to giving on any, you know, you know, type of production that you're working on. But um, yeah, it's pretty much. A nice little flow chart to represent it. I don't know what this is supposed to be. Like after final edit, we're going back to art department. Maybe this is for the next episode. Um, all right, let's talk about to, the type to of me, skills. It, yeah, I think to me it represents that it's not just that one end point that goes back. It's it should really be that all of those bits in the middle go back themselves. They will have sure. their own little inner loops because the the real what this really represents is that the rapid iteration that you're able to accomplish when you've got all of your creatives in the same place at the same time. What happened before was you do play blasts, chuck them over the fence, get notes, Chinese whispers. It was all a uh, very, very protracted, long process. And it was, it was difficult because of that. And it take longer. This now is all happening in real time. The real time component to me that's the most interesting, the one that gets talked about all the time is the real time render speed. The thing that's to me the most interesting is the real time collaboration. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah, the fact that I mean I'm well, let's be honest, I'm rarely at real time render speeds. A lot of the stuff that we're doing here, we're pushing Unreal very hard and very far. And, you know, unless we're doing actual virtual production in a volume, where our concern for frames per second kind of goes out the window and we're just making good looking stuff, right? And so it is it is rarely real time for a lot of this stuff. But yes, it is absolutely true. Is the the real time aspect of this has become the integration of the post world into the production world, right? And so that's that's where the magic 
sort of lies. And it, I don't think it's an accident, by the way, that this kind of resembles a GPU. I don't <laughs> I think that's a nice little, a nice sly little, um, you know. Anyways, all right. So we're looking at sort of skills that you need to work in this space, right? And so I laid out a list here of the untrainable skill set. This is like when I'm looking at the resumes and I'm interviewing people, there are, you know, list items for, for what they know how to do and things like that. That's all well and good. It's very hard to, to you know, get a feel for who's good at some of this other stuff in those interviews. But this is really the skills that I need uh, my artists to have, you know, coming into this space, like communication, problem solving, creativity, emotional intelligence and patience are sort of the same thing, right? But, um, you know, just being able to work in a high stress environment, that's sort of the, you know, like what the key at what I'm getting at, why, why I added this here is because, you know, you, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it for a lot of people getting into, uh, let's say people coming from the games or visual effects side of things, or if you haven't been on set yet, it's that when that that it's hot, it's stressful. It, there are things that, you know, flying and things are happening quickly. People are under a lot of duress. Time and, is money. And it's fun. And it it's is fun super fun. The rush that you get at the end of the day, especially if you've pulled something off, if you've had, you know, even if you're having the worst day of your life, just getting one little win is enough to like you just send those endorphins flying. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, you need to be prepared for it, that that having patience, being able to work under pressure is an absolute skill uh, for working in these sort of virtual production environments, because, you know, there's, especially when the, when the volume is up, the LED wall is up, it, it, there, there's one hot seat and it's, you're in it, you know, you, there's, well, there's several, we'll talk about it, but there are several hot seats <laughs> now, but there, there used to be one hot seat. And, and, but yeah, when you're um, responsible for the content and the content isn't right, then, you know, all eyes are going to be on you. So being able to work with someone standing over your shoulder, eyeballing you and asking you, is it ready yet? Is, is absolutely uh, an untrainable skill, but a skill nonetheless. Um, there should but be another one up there that's breathing. Yes. Because that's, that, that's an, an understated <laughs> skill to have it sounds daft and hippie like but if you if the one of the secrets to being under pressure and being able to to be calm and deal with it is breathing yeah yep cg Sometimes i forget CG to breathe. skill yeah we all do <laughs> i do too um but yeah so the trainable stuff the stuff that we can provide for you um <laughs> With the visualization side of things, and I'm sticking with that list I had earlier, we've we've got, uh, you know, learning how to uh, operate the metahumans and use metahumans in your previs. Uh, iClone is another one. If you're if you're an iClone fan and people that are um, comfortable working with that, all of them are, are you know, definitely doable. But um, I don't think, you know, outside of metahumans and iClone and, and using using stuff that you could find on turbo squid and trying to block things out that way or even just using the the mannequin or like the the um the the default sort of characters that you get you know by just by opening unreal that's not cutting it anymore because it is so easy to customize things and create just a, a killer metahuman that looks like the actor that you're supposed to be representing it's it's so easy and e e uh, achievable that uh you know it's a skill that you you've got to learn and it doesn't take a lot of time which just you know it just gets better over time. Um, posing, blocking. So the blocking phase here too. So we have actually, and this is a little secret, uh, a Zoic secret, the, um, creating, instead of like having a library of motion capture and animations, we found over time that having a library of poses is actually more beneficial to us. There's a lot of, we've identified probably 40 or 50 different common poses that, that people do that we can use um, inside of Sequencer because you can load poses and blend those two clips together to create a very fast blocking phase, right? And now you can go from adding a metahuman and use, you know, using a, a similar, the exact same skeleton throughout, like something that is uh, acceptable to Manny and metahumans and yada, yada. If you create all of your custom assets with that same skeleton, you can then put all of your poses and all of your blocking on those. So creating our um, previs using poses as opposed to um, motion capture, even if you're doing AI and it's fast to go out and get AI these days, take some video, upload it to um, one of the, the websites that will take it and spit out a mocap uh, block for you. I mean, even that takes a lot more time than it does 
grabbing a bunch of poses, blending them together, you can export that animation and boom, you're off to having, you know, a, a previs or animation phase and you can do it in Maya or whatever. Um, so having, you know, skills in sequencer and being able to operate a camera, whether it's a virtual camera or a, um, you know, in, in engine camera, you know, making sure that you're familiar with the terms that you're, you're not, not everything is a pan, 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 pan. You're trucking, you're dollying, you're zooming and zollying. Uh, knowing all of those terms and being able to animate those cameras and knowing, you know, having a good eye, that's, a, you know, the creativity untrainable setup here, that's, that's one of the things, but, you know, just being able to operate a camera and have a good uh, sense of composition, you'll get there. Uh, performance capture again. We're you know, like uh, we just mentioned the motion capture stuff and the facial capture stuff. Yeah, just ha having the different types of technology, whether it's faceware or the iOS capture or whatever you're using to to you know capture, or maybe you're working inside of a volume, a motion capture volume. Um, you know, there's a lot of skills that that go into that, but there's still going to be cleanup and retargeting that needs to happen. So you need a little bit of uh, you know, skills inside of whether it's uh, Maya and doing the human IK style retargeting, mo uh, motion builder using their human IK retargeter uh, or, um, you know, inside of the engine and using retargeting in engine, but, you know, cleaning up that motion capture, bringing it in and uh, executing those sequencer um, timelines is another valuable skill and how knowing how to set up a sequencer timeline properly. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to go about approaching that. And there's a lot of pitfalls out there. Would you be, you know, very careful to not fall into one of these traps for sequencer and get things kind of uh, screwed up very quickly. Um, virtual art department skills, we are talking about using not just mega scans, it, you know, mega scans is amazing, but uh, you, I, I no longer can can say that if, if, I, I can't hire people <laughs> that only know how to open mega scans and import and kit bash mega scans assets. It's it used to be enough. It's no longer enough. A, a virtual art department artist needs to have um, you know the know how to scan their own props uh, when scanning's not available. Uh, model texture their own props. Uh, they need to know how to, you know, set up a scene for proper shading and lighting. Not always. That's always that. That sometimes you can have larger productions where shading and lighting is offloaded to another specification of another artist there. Um, but sometimes, you know, having at least a basic lighting set up and knowing how your shading is going to react in that situation, having that understanding for that, um, and then optimization is huge, right? Especially for the, you know, working in the volume and, you know, projecting your your uh, work on on. Um, anything where it needs to go live and you have, let's say, you, you know, uh, you're working on a volume and you have two cameras, right? Or a green screen even, and you have two cameras. That's, let's say, 24 or 30 frames per second per camera, right? And not even counting the, you know, the, the drop that you're going to get just by having um, uh, Unreal open in the background, right? So you need to have your scene running as fast as possible, as much as possible, like you, even throughout your entire timeline, if you're doing animation and things like that. And so learning how to optimize your scene, what kind of workflows for mip mapping and texture LODing and, and you know, model LODs and, um, you know, just, just knowing how to get the most performance and the best quality look, especially for, you know, it, it, any kind of tricks. If you're making translucent objects, you're baking reflections and things like that, and trying to get the, the most performance back into your um, scene without sacrificing quality. That is a huge skill. It is a trainable skill, but that is, you know, there's a lot, and that's its own class, by the way. We, I think we have a separate um, world building class that goes into a lot of this type of stuff, but um, it's yeah. Definitely, it's definitely worth saying that whilst it should be the VAD's job to make it run fast, you're going to end up with a set that you have to fix being an onset technical operator, you're going to, it's going to happen to you. So it's definitely worth knowing as both, both of those people. And yeah, Scott said we have world building class that focuses on world building. And this is the aftermath of world building where you get the world and, and deal with it. But um, yeah. yeah, both, both sides of those, of uh, that uh, coin or divide, it's not a divide, you know, there's people who straddle that the, the technical and creative, but uh, everybody should know it a bit. Um, we had we have a question here as well um, that's relevant, saying, 
uh, to what you're talking about right now, which is saying, can you talk a little bit more about scanning sets, especially as it relates to tech viz? Is that something that you cover in the course? Absolutely. Yeah, we actually have a um, one of our uh, guest speakers is specifically coming in to talk about scanning, LIDAR scanning, uh, nerfs, things like that. And um, I, I don't know if we've nailed them down specifically, but I talk about it as well. I, I cover a lot of that, um, you know, even as simple as using an iPad to scan it, it you know, you've got to do it. You can't, uh, you can't get a lot of things done without scanning something. Um, I use it a lot for actually every, every set that I go to, uh, I, I scan their, um, the LED volume, especially if you have a curved screen, so your LED screens have a curvature to them. Scanning is just hands down, you know, you, you have to do it. Um, you can get the measurements exactly right for your projection side of things. Um, you can, you know, measure measure twice, cut once is the, you, you, you measure twice and also scan it so that you can build the LED properly once. Um, yeah, scanning is a huge part, and uh, again, like like Ed said, with the world building class, it's you know we can take a huge detour down um, scanning road, um, and and we do in the class a little bit, but yeah, it's 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 its own beast. Um, yeah, so then we get into the uh, the skills we needed for the live uh, side of things. There's you know the the broadcast work that we were talking about earlier, and so working with the disguise or the pixotopes. Um, you know, learning how to pull a key out of there or what makes for a good key. Um, you know, lighting goes into a lot of that. So learning a lot of the onset lighting, the tracking softwares, um, which is, you know, goes into the ICB effects things as well. Uh, and, you know, learning how to operate. And there's a lot of flavors of these. They all do, again, this very similar things and they work, they all work well and they all have their strengths. They all have uh, fail points and just figuring out and learning what kind of tracking software you're going to be working with, what their strengths are, what their fail points are. Um, definitely trainable skills. We go over a lot of that in the course. Um, LED panel management, you know, any any kind of panel that you're working with is going to have its own software. Um, it's also going to have its own sort of attitude and you got to <laughs> figure out exactly how to, um, you know, a, a configure these sort of things. So we talk a little bit about, you know, uh, if, if, row or aoto or whoever nova star doesn't come in and set your panels up for you we'll talk a little bit about how to uh, pop open their software and um, set up your own sort of grid of panels um, we get into some general unreal workflows for whoops hello um for a lot of we, we cover a lot of unreal side of things and that you know encompassing all of the rest of this stuff we talk about color pipelines that is a huge portion of this uh you know that will not make or break, uh, but it'll definitely accentuate any other errors in your ways. Uh, if your color is off, and I've you know I've seen it. We visit a lot of stages, and there's a lot of places that we go to that are you know they will say they're buttoned up. We're ready to go. You can come in, and you can uh, you know just fire up a camera and get going. And I'm, I get there, and I'm like, you know what, your color's kind of off. Like there's there's you there's a setting here or a trigger there that you you've missed, or you know it's you the, the the epic guidelines will go so far. Um, they, there's a lot to color workflows, a lot to color pipelines, and there's a lot of, it's it's just a misunderstanding. And so, you know, we, we spend a good amount of time talking about color and open color IO, how to go from, you know, your different uh, bit depths and working with uh, the the live footage, what, what all your different um, hardwares need to be set at, right? And so that, leads directly into the camera IO type of stuff, knowing how to manage your data, knowing how to work with the tools that Unreal provides for you for doing a lot of this stuff. If this this can be substituted for your disguise type of work as well, if you're not doing the standard end display stuff, but switchboard web, web remote level uh, snapshots are very important, learning how to use all of those. Uh, DMX is another one we get into and we got to we had a very good DMX demo very recently, and I look forward to seeing that one yet again. There's a lot of information in that one, um, but yeah, interfacing with the, um, the the grips and gaffers on set, and um, so yeah, we talk about uh, let's let out of those skills. You know what? If let's say you have earned yourself some of those skill sets, you get you know to the next level. Uh, what are you going to find yourself doing? What are the types of jobs that are available to you, right? And so. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I know we're running short on time here. So um, really quickly with the bad stuff you can work. This is again, we're gonna be working on the box, not necessarily 
on set. Some of this stuff you can find yourself on a stage doing. We do have um, on on set bad. There are people that work, you know, in the volume that are ready to go at a moment's notice to either scan something or, you know, uh, pop out a, a, into ZBrush and get a, a real asset going very quickly. Um, but for the most part, this is you can do this off, you know, off the stage, on the box, in your home, at a studio, whatever. Um, virtual art department, you've got your environment design, like we were talking about your kit bashing, just you know, creating levels, knowing how to, uh, you know, uh, properly design and, and fill in a landscape, you know, keeping in mind composition and um, optimization. Uh, that's, you know, you can, there's a lot of jobs in the scanning, you know, field right now. There's a lot of, you know, um, the props and assets type of things that so you've got people that are doing scanning. Uh, and those, those sort of worlds have been colliding. Your traditional modelers are learning how to scan. Your scanning technicians are learning how to clean up and model things like that. Um, and then your tools and pipeline thing, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to further integrate the engine. Uh, we actually I want to make a quick mention that we talked to Ian uh, Fursa when he comes in for color pipeline stuff. Uh, we usually talk to him about color pipelines, but um, he uh, has got a great toolkit that he's wrote himself. It's a plugin. Um, he's a specialist in developing these tools for in-camera VFX. And uh, so we want to talk to him about some of the work he's done there. Um, he's another one of the great guests that we have come to talk to the class. Uh, the, the visualization stuff, we have previs artists that are learning how to do a lot of this other work, but we do have people that are dedicated to previs specifically. Um, we have post viz artists, and then let me tell you, it is a very different type of work and sometimes can require a very different type of artists. Some of the post viz artists are way more technical and are good with cameras and image plate projection that we do inside of the engine. Um, there's a lot more technical setup involved there than some of the previs stuff. And so we tend to put our more creative people in the previs roles, more technical people in the post viz and the tech viz roles, right? Um, virtual scouting, this is something everyone should know how to do. Pick up an iPad or, you know, pick up a headset and do some, you know, pop into VR, pop into your, uh, you know, uh, uh, what the the bcam app and do some virtual scouting inside it's really fun if you haven't done it figure uh get get some tutorials going we'll come back here and watch another cg pro uh shakedown of how to do that it's super fun um performance capture there's jobs in you know motion capture the capture side of it itself being on top of the tech and also the cleanup work there uh the animation and bcam side of things you can do you can capture your um a lot of these volumes will capture not only your camera tracking for uh, virtual production, but also the motion capture of you know mocap suit at the same time. So um, seeing these worlds kind of come together is amazing. Uh, you know your green screen tech. So these are sort of the on in the field jobs on this on set. We're working with uh, AR XR techs that are sort of different. I mean there's there's a lot of it takes more you know it takes a village kind of thing. Whoopsie. Uh, it takes a village that there's more than one person required to work, you know, operate these larger green screen volumes here. And so you've got, you know, uh, sort of a breakdown of, of uh, skills there. So we've got people that are specifically paying attention to all the hardware, pulling keys and things like that. You've got your media encoders and colorist people do, doing um, live DIT on set. Uh, and, and making sure that your all the, your camera LUTs are applied and things like that. We've got our... Um, so your ISC VFX roles, you get, you know, the VP supervisor, that person just is a slacker, doesn't do anything, just goes and sits in the corner and sips a latte. Uh, no, the VP supervisor, a lot of the times, uh, and this is where I find myself, is that you have to be able to assume any one of these roles should you not have them that day. Um, it's, it's, you need to be able to do the virtual gaffer, onset, bad, scene loading, data wrangler, whatever. I need to be able to talk to my team and, and, you know, operate them through the day and make sure that the day goes flowing and swimming. So I'm basically acting as first AD uh, as uh, for the for the VP team. You know, so it's you've got your first AD that's working with the talent and keeping uh, their their side of things on track. And I'm basically sticking around with my team, making sure that they are on track to keep the content flowing on the screens throughout the day and capturing everything as we need to and getting all the data we need to go into post successfully. Um, virtual gaffers, you're there doing some some onset lighting, maybe working with the uh, the onset actual lighter and stuff, making sure that your 
uh, simpatico that everything lines up. You got your keys and your fills set the way you need to. You're on set bad. You're doing scanning. You're doing you know kit bashing. Last second changes from the director coming in. You're bringing things into the scene and making it work. You're blending that practical foreground element with that background inside of the wall. We need to create that mid-ground space. That's what Onset VAD is also specialized in doing, is creating that seamless transition from the foreground into the volume. Uh, data wranglers, this is you know people that are doing the level screenshots and making sure that everything is sort of like a script supervisor. That role has you know traditionally been with the you know the production side of things we need our own version of that in virtual production to kind of you know make sure that all of the data that gets captured on set is organized and dictated to the post department cleanly um we've got your tracking and motac mocap techs that are responsible for the cameras and making sure those are always up and working and then you've got your hardware specialist making sure that the wall is doing what it's supposed to be doing at all times that person's probably checking you know uh, youtube once or twice throughout the day but uh yeah these are all different you know roles that you that have been sort of invented over the past few years and if not invented they've definitely been elevated you know they 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 all, some of these roles existed well before you know led walls virtual production sort of came into the forefront but they have now been, you know, just brought into a greater sense of importance because of the new workflows that we've found ourselves using. And, you know, that's great. It's amazing. It's wonderful. They're good. It's great to have the people that are seasoned previs artists now being, you know, uh, all the more involved in final decisions in production workflows. Uh, I'm going to scroll right through this flowchart that is the exact same list that I just gave uh, in flowchart form. I will stay on it long enough to uh, allow screenshots to happen and talk about it a little bit. I think I got it all there. Sorry, that's, that we were. This is a much larger conversation here, but yeah, a lot of the same stuff that we were talking about there, just kind of broken down in the the different departments and major roles that you can find yourself doing. Um, in, in several of these different types of uh, production workflows, right? So, you know, you've got your, the, I think it's in gray here where a lot of the traditional type of work was already happening. And in the, the orange here is where we've sort of expanded to bring our post-production people into production. So <laughs> taking over. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it is very cool to see all of these do roles. And, I, you know, again, this, is, this isn't every production. Right, I've been on shows where it's just two of us. There's been one person operating the box and doing all of this half of the screen, and one person, you know, that's up and walking around doing the other half of the the screen. Here, it's you can do this run and gun, two people in a garage type of setup. Right, it it happens all the time. Uh, you just have to know who's going to be responsible for these skill sets uh, going into it and know that each one of these skill sets is going to be needed. I have also been on productions where there are at least one or two people for every one of these roles. I've walked into um, uh, you know, stages where there's 30, 40 people and they are all doing virtual production. And I was just blown away. I was like, wow, you guys filled every seat you've got people very specialized in doing very you know minute detailed uh work and it's amazing it's awesome it's very cool to see it's inspiring uh and i hope to see that much more often moving forward and i feel like which we will definitely see more of that um all right let's talk about the class really quick um ed do you want to talk about this page or should we just get yeah. right in yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Just very briefly, you know, CG Pro as a school we've been going for the last two and a half years. We focused heavily on virtual production. We do teach some other things back into the traditional CG realm and also in, into games. And we teach simulation industry. We just did some training for NASA and some other things outside of film. But we're a high end CG training, independent training center. We focus, as this says, on, on cutting edge CG. Um, for, so we do a lot of Unreal training. We do a lot of virtual production training. We're an Unreal Authorized Training Center. Um, we were the first Connectors Training Center in, in the world to offer uh, the Connectors program. And we continue to, to innovate and in education. And that's what we're passionate about. Um, yeah, go ahead to the next one. All right. So the class. Uh, 
you get to hang out with me. That's that's. I don't know if that's a perk, but uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely is. You know, and I can I can speak to this. Scott's a good friend of mine. We've been friends for ten years or more. Um, and I worked with Scott. He is a, a very very knowledgeable, very smart guy, and he really loves teaching, and he's very good at it. So I, I, um, I'm obviously incredibly biased, but uh, I can <laughs> I can brag on your behalf if you like. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I I will say this: there will be times that you, I will be asked a question I will not know, but I will not let that go, and I will find that answer for you. If I don't have it right off the top of my head, I will figure it out. I'll get back to you. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this is what the this is my favorite class to teach because it is the one that's seeing the most expansion. And as soon as I get the information on paper, it is outdated. There's already a new workflow. Uh, there's already new stuff going on. And so, yeah, this is it's a very challenging course, but it's also very rewarding. And especially to see those success stories, if you can take a second to go to CG Pro's website, check out their success stories. We have a lot of people that are now working in this space that have come from these classes and that just brings me joy. Um, anyways, so, we talk about uh, a lot of stuff over the six weeks. It's a bit of a fire hose of information. Um, but yeah, so we focus really on the first couple of weeks on the virtual art department side of things. We're staying in the engine. We're giving you a refresher uh, for those of you who are either coming out of the connectors program or maybe have you know not worked with Unreal or not worked with Unreal in a while. Uh, we are, you know, we, we focus on. So I give a history of you know how we got to where we are. Whoopsie, I can't click and drag here. I can't highlight things. Um, we give a history of the tech, how it got to this point where it is today. We talk about the gear that is used. It's good to have some perspective to kind of know where your place is in this world by knowing how big the world is, right? So, um, and then we drill down into some techniques and practices inside of the engine. We talk about world building for a little bit, uh, how to approach a world building sort of uh, you know, challenge for, for whether you're building for an LED wall or green screen or LED volume. And like I said, they're all they're all sort of different now. Um, we talk about a bunch of different methodologies for world building and we get into um, some lighting, talk about, you know, how to uh, work with Nanite and Lumen and now that it is available to us in virtual production. It's very, very new. 5.1, I had to kind of rewrite everything because Nanite and Lumen, all of a sudden, you can use it inside of an LED volume. So um, we cover a lot of that stuff and how to set that up, what to look out for, what doesn't work in the volume, you know, uh, color, OCIO, color grading on set, all of that good stuff. We covered that. And it doesn't look like a ton, but it's, trust me, this is a lot. I always, it's a three hour course and I go over every single time. Um, week two, we talk about scouting. We talk about how to set up a multi-user session. We talk about Perforce, uh, we cover a VR scouting. If for those of you who have not done this stuff yet, we wanna get you working so that you can collaborate with your clients, with each other. You wanna, you know, get these, the share a scene, you know, and be able to to work with, uh, with each other and collaborate together, uh, whether it's a client or a friend, right? Um, levels, we talk about either the levels or the world partition and data layers, and there's two different approaches for that. And how do we do, how do we set up a project for collaborative working? And then the second half of that class is spent optimizing. We talk workflows for, um, you know, A, how do you profile and figure out what to optimize first? And then we drill down into, okay, let's say it's this, let's say it's your modeling, let's say it's your texturing, let's say it's your lighting. I show you a bunch of techniques for all of that on how to make things run faster without sacrificing quality. Um, that is, you know, again, that takes up a lot of time. I go way over on time. Um, there's recordings of all the courses and that's that's exactly why, because some people will need to drop off and go about their lives <laughs> and I'm still gonna be talking for the next hour. Um, all right, so then uh, week three, we get into our projection setups and display being the, the uh, you know, the flavor du jour uh, for you know our, our workflow here. We talk about how to model the meshes that you're going to use in end display, how to set up your cluster inside of the engine. We talk about uh, using test grids, Arucos, things like that, how to add light cards, multi frustrums, screen screens, you name it. Everything that has to deal with end display and camera projection um, will come. And this week, we talk about the, the Brompton software because row panels are the most common, I think, still. 
Um, there's been a lot of, you know, the, the, like I said, the Nova Stars, Aotos are starting to creep into a lot of spaces, but more studios, I think, are going to still be using Rose. Uh, and so that's why I focus on that software in particular. But we can talk about any software. This is where you get the grab bag of like, hey, can we look at, you know, zero density disguise, that kind of stuff. And so I'll talk about that. Uh, before we get into the shoot prep, we talk about, you know, how to op scene, set up your, your Unreal scene itself, any files, camera film backs, uh, camera tracking. We set up our, uh, you know, this is where this is the week where we put the, the the practice to the pavement and we actually get um, we launch a scene via switchboard on our screens uh, and we're using camera tracking, whether it's, you know, your whatever you have at home set up. I will help you set up your vibe, your Oculus, your, you know, your iPhone. I don't whatever it is that we can use for camera tracking. We will help you get that set up and you so that you can do virtual production in your house. Um, and then we talk about the tools, remote control level snapshots, um, um, material parameter collections, all of the tools that you need for a successful uh, day on set. Uh, week five, we get into a more of a green screen focus. And again, this is where we would talk about the zero density, uh, pixitopes, disguise, that kind of stuff, live inputs, um, how to deal with a lot of the stuff in engine. I don't like talking about composure, but I still do it. I, I still, it's still uh, relevant. Um, we and then we get into a material function based keyer. What that means is I show you how to not use composure if you don't want to, and how to pull green screen keys inside of the engine using materials. Uh, we talk about image plates and doing this is post viz. I kind of work post viz and live green screen in together. Uh, we cover concepts like time code, gen lock, that all that good stuff. Um, and then week six, you know, by this time we're we're I'm taking requests. You know, the the hotline is open. Um, we're talking mo motion capture. You know, integrating that camera tracking software, integrating animation, how to set up your sequencer uh, tools, blueprints, and Niagara usually fills the space. But uh, a lot of the times, I find that I've got enough um, requests for d more details on other weeks topics that I've I've you know we'll save this for like a bonus sort of class. And uh, we, we figure out, we just answer all the questions. It's a big old Q&A session. Um, but yeah, I do love, you know, jumping into Niagara and Blueprints and talking about those and giving a, a demo. It's a little bit of extra credit for you guys. Um, yeah, so, um, and Ed, back to you. This is, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's a six-week course. We've talked about it a few times tonight. Um, it's all taught just like this. I'm going to be standing here, um, hopefully not shouting too loud um, <laughs> over Zoom. And uh, yeah, there's there's live mentoring. I'm available um, through a private Facebook group or three. I check that very frequently. Um, there's labs that we have uh, office hours. There's the class is taught uh, on Saturday. Um, I think it's nine to noon on Saturday. Uh, but then Tuesdays or Wednesdays, one of those nights, we have office hours for. So if you can't catch the class and you have to watch the recording, hopefully you can catch the Tuesday or Wednesday nights. Um, I know that East Coast is a thing, so we try not to make it too late for the people on the East Coast or the other coasts. Um, other parts of the world. Yes. Uh, so yeah, two two times a week. We start in a couple of weeks, uh, June 10th. And again, all recordings, uh, you know, all of our sessions are, are available forever. Take them, download them. You have access to me. My guests are, uh, you know, community. There's a large community and anyone, you know, ask the moderator, Lily, and she's our community moderator. She's amazing. And there's a huge community, a lot of people that are constantly uh, looking for just either technical answers or creative decision or support or collaboration. There's a huge community around CG Pro and it's awesome to see these people grow week in and week out. Anything else to add? Um, no, I think that's most of it. Yeah, we, uh, as Scott said, we supplied the, the recordings to you guys. If you miss anything, then you can catch up really quickly. They're normally up really quick. Um, you get to to see those after the course is over. Um, yeah, the the price currently is 3497 So that's uh, available to pay in full, or we do have... Um, as long as the timing is right, payment options to split the cost up into more than one payment. Um, so get let us know if that helps. Um, but yeah, I think you did a great job there going through the major components of this. We're we're live 
training school. And I think, again, worth emphasizing that the the great thing about this being live is that we, every single round, every time we teach every class, we go back to it, we, we update it, we make sure it's relevant to the current tools, which change at a blistering pace, thanks to the, the epic epic uh, innovation at Epic, um, they, they come out with things so quickly that uh, it, this is why we do it this way. Um, but yeah, it's a very active community. We're all passionate artists, including myself as the co-founder of the school. I'm still very passionate VFX artist, CG artist, and um, it's very it's artist led, and we're a we're a thriving community. As Scott said, we very care a lot about the community, and we do a lot of these kinds of things, which are free. We also have some paid experiences like these classes, and there's other things that you can access after the class to help you keep connected to us and allow you to get ongoing support ongoing trainings and uh yeah we just we we love doing this so if you'd love to come and join us we'd be very happy to to uh, have you in the community and if you guys have any more questions i know that we had one or two pop up here at the end so as we're into the q a section um yeah. let me just rearrange these screens a little bit i can make us bigger, bigger. there we go um, so somebody asked, uh, what level of unreal experience do you recommend before the course? That's a great question. Uh, Definitely level of unreal some. experience, uh, minimal to some, <laughs> you know, I'd say the connectors program is a great launch pad for the work that we do here, having a foundational understanding. So if you've done anything like the fellowship or the connectors program or in any intro course through any of the other schools out there this is just something that um you know gets you off the ground and working with uh mega scans uh, sequencer um you know uh the, the camera tools be just feeling comfortable enough uh you know in in the engine and navigating the engine and being able to to find your way i can kind of you know, I, I talk through a lot and I, I try to make sure that I cover all the concepts from, you know, a, a granular level, but I I don't get like too, too beginner in terms of like, here's how to, you know, here's how WASD works. So, you know, an, an, an intro would be, you know, uh, we used to call it the advanced course, but I felt like that was too exclusive. Uh, <laughs> it's... I wouldn't say it's super advanced. It's specific. It's a specific course for uh, virtual production, and so not necessarily advanced. But yeah. But you should definitely know your way around Unreal Engine, how to create a project, how to navigate around a viewport, how to to build a little world, how what lights are, just the the fundamentals of Unreal. If you need some help with that, we're happy to help with it. We have other trainings that specialize on that on that generalist foundational unreal stuff but uh yeah someone somebody else was asking how long are the live sessions um i think they i think you're asking about the classes yeah um these live sessions are usually an hour the the free public webinars that we do but the classes um the ic vfx classes three hours training at the weekend and then the midweek lab is two hours. Yep. Five hours per week, six week class, 30 hours of training. And the offline support through the Facebook group, the, um, we do sometimes have some additional guests and on top of those hours, mm -hmm. but, uh, the Facebook group, you can ask, ask questions throughout the week. And um, then when we go to uh, set, it's usually a full eight hour day, uh, live stage visit. So it's a full production day. We shoot. Uh, content you know yep yeah we go th go through bringing this together and then go through a shoot m modeling a shoot and, and usually get several shots done with a dp cinematographer operator um scott being an instructor i'm often at those things too so yeah they're, they're super fun uh and they really bring it all home um if you have any more questions uh, somebody asked how realistic it is it to expect one person to have the majority of these skills and we, i think we kind of answered that um as we went although it's worth uh, underscoring what um nah. scott 
mentioned uh, in terms of there's the big horrible diagram. Yeah, so, hang on, I'll fix that. <laughs> the, what that diagram, which we've evolved a little bit, uh, and this list form represents really is is skills and responsibilities, not necessarily people and jobs, but things that you can do. And as Scott said, that some some stages, often uh, smaller ones, will have one person as the operator, and that they should know all of this in in some depth but maybe not the, the extreme depth it on scott already mentioned on bigger productions you might have uh you know this all evolved from things that i got to work on some of the, those things you know jungle book is a good example john brennan was when we were talking about the one guy in the hot seat that was him you know he he's been his mission since to make it more people because it's really hard when it's just one of you and you've got all of that responsibility and money rolling every second uh so on bigger productions you might break that down into more people partly because there's a lot to do but also it helps each one of those people cover those skills to a, a greater depth um it, it does depend per production per stage scott i'm sure you've got things to add to it yeah, totally. There's, I mean, like my goal here was to say that each of these blocks could be a person, the orange there, and that these are the skills that those people would typically have. Sometimes it's like, like I've got people that are really good at just pre biz and that's it. And that's great. That's, you know, that's enough. They don't necessarily need to know all of this stuff. But the more you know, the more indispensable you become, which you know is a blessing and a curse. We all know you make all the money, but you have no time to spend it because you're busy working all the time. So <laughs> there's there's a you know there's there's a lot. It can you can get specialized, and you can also be a generalist. There's a, and that's a whole nother webinar. We can talk for another hour about how you know the difference between specializing in something and being a generalist um i like to say you know uh, a jack of all trades master of one has been yeah. that's been my mantra of the people i love to hire is a generalist someone who knows a little bit about everything but is really good at doing one thing uh specifically so i totally absolutely underscore that i think it's important these days to be a generalist I've, I've been responsible for teams in virtual production when you have only specialists it's tough because if you finish a certain type of work and you have those people there that can't do the next thing you've moved on to or they're they're not able to do anything you want them to be able to do things you want people who have who have, have a broad knowledge at, or at the very minimum a good problem solving ability and and being fast learners because you can really you can learn something very complex if you focus on it you've got the right mentorship you can learn complicated things very quickly if you have the right mindset to it and that's why i think the greatest skill you can have going into this beyond unreal engine five point whatever's new shiny fancy tool is the good problem solving ability being a good generalist means being a good problem solver and being a, a fast learner and i honestly think that there's, that's something which most people can do and it, it does it does take pushing yourself a little bit but that's tremendously rewarding and if you the more the more of a generalist you are i, I think the more um rewarding the work can be because you, you can jump around you can solve a, a lot of people's issues you become more valuable and valued in the community and it just gives you more options it, it, you can get paid more yes but also you, the the fulfillment i think that comes from being able to do more things um it really it, it, it's what i've loved to do so i definitely have a bias there um, and scott is the same but i do i do think that it that thinking in that way and there's certain things that i think you can do to to get good at that even adding a little bit of uh, basic kind of programming knowledge or computer science, if you like, just breaking it down to its real fundamentals helps you to kind of think in that type of way. What, or maybe more than computer science, but en engineering, what what is what makes a good engineer? It's a good problem solver. Somebody who can essentially do what engineers do is to tr solve problems constantly all day. And how do they do it? They take big problems, they break them down into small problems, and they solve those small problems. 
and you isolate things you you dial out the noise isolate individual things and solve those and you solve multiple small things it fits together into a big thing that works if it was to try and break down engineering and computer science into one idea that would be it and that's i think what makes a, a great um technical artist you see what we did we got him started <laughs> sorry yeah no it's all good i really I actually just want dinner <laughs> but yeah um <laughs> No, that's amazing. That's it. Yeah, it, he's exactly right. It's, you know, it's, I've said it a few times. I've heard Ed say it a few times, but it's not, it's absolutely true. And you'll hear other people say it. Uh, it, it is absolutely true. I do see another question in here. Uh, advice for people not living in LA. Absolutely. So I can speak specifically to Zoic. We are, you know, um, fully remote. There's a lot of studios that are still fully remote. There's a lot of not only that, there's there's a lot of studios that are fully remote. There's opportunities in in remote work for a lot of these roles, um, but there are stages everywhere. I've seen stages in places I would never expect them. Like there's they're they're popping up all over the place. There's there's a new there's a huge one that just got announced. I think in West Virginia or Virginia. Like there's there's they're everywhere. There's North Carolina. They're all over, up and down the East Coast. They're up and down the Midwest. They're all over the West Coast. They're they're everywhere. So uh, opportunities abound in this industry right now. It's the time to get in, and it it feels like it's been that way for the last four or five years. It's been like okay, it's it's happening, you know. And there was a gold rush, and then there was you know you had your your inflation, and then your deflation a little bit, the kind of correction for it. Um, and that's as as the world was waking up from COVID and stuff. There was a bit of a course correction, but it ab, people that thought that just wrote it off and said it's going away, absolutely untrue. Um, yeah, it's it's expanding and it's it's expanding on a more uh, I think a, a, a more stable course this time. There were you did have a lot of people that got in just to get in the first time around, um, but now that we have a lot of people that are trained and skilled getting into this space and doing it the right way. There's a lot more opportunities to do it the right way, and it's it's only going to get better. And because we are pushing it, and it's you know, so the people that are writing it off, they weren't really paying attention. They were only seeing the people that did it wrong, which there were a lot of. Um, but yeah, those of us that kind of stuck around and are continuing to push and innovate in this space, I mean, you, you, we're in it. It's exciting, you know, and, and yeah, to to your point, watching a bunch of people fumbling around with it and getting it wrong is the necessary part of any any endeavor that's big and worth it if you saw how where, where where insurance companies come from is because boats kept trying to sail across the ocean and kept sinking and it was just too risky for people to want to keep doing it so they invented this idea of the corporation to wrap a boat and insurance to to encourage people to keep having adventures and exploring because they just kept trying and they kept getting to go into the bottom of the ocean well that, that everything that we try and do that's new that's exciting it fails and and we've like working on the lion king was a massive r d exercise as well as trying to make a big movie it was a, a huge so the things we tried to do on there were, were, were too, probably too many things were <laughs> you the nina or things. the santa maria <laughs> <laughs> i probably both of them yeah <laughs> it, it's I think it's really important to 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 think of that when you're when you're trying something new when you're learning is doing something new you know the whole experience of of coming and taking a class or trying something new whether you take a class in it or not being comfortable with being uncomfortable is is again one of the greatest skills that you can have people ask me ask me a lot of a, a couple of careers that I've had how do you get good at programming or how do you get good at cg and really i think one of the great best answers i've got to that is be be patient with yourself right because you're going to you're gonna mess it up you're going to get it wrong you're going to try something and it's not going to work being patient with yourself through that process allows you to grow and to get better at something and being okay with that and not thinking like oh, I tried this one thing once and it didn't work out, so I must be crap at that. It's not true. It you know you need the the spark for it and the and the desire to do it to pull you through it. But getting it wrong is something that people should be encouraged. You know, is to, trying something and getting it wrong, which is what learning is all about, and being a part of something new. You know, it was it was sort of 
both ex exciting being part of these movies and terrifying because none of it worked most of the time <laughs> so if we were if we were being down on ourselves about uh, it not working we would have a bad time we'd never finish but being being sorry you got me going again sorry no it's I'll all good now <laughs> <laughs> no it's perfect man it's great because it's true you know like it's it's yeah, it's, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to this slide, the thank you slide, and if there's uh, any more questions, drop them in. Now's your chance. But yeah, it is a uh, it's a good point to end on. It's it's definitely one that needs to be underscored. You know, it's it's learning is vital, but it's also painful, and you gotta let yourself you be open to it. Be you bold know? enough to suck at something new. That was an expression yeah. that someone told me, and I love it because you're gonna do you're going to every new thing no no one gets great at the thing that they do when they do it the first time like think of there's one one of my mentors that uses walking as an example of that uh and like what how were you at walking when you first tried to walk probably not so great you kept falling over all the time but the parents didn't say to you well that person's just not a walker <laughs> you know, the, and every some something that happens when we grow up, you think that we're supposed to be great at things when we first try them, and it's just not true. You're going to be bad at it, and that's why we create created this community the way we did, very carefully, to create an environment where it's okay to 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 mess things up. It's okay to be new at something, and we're all hit. We're all teachers. We're all students. So anyway. Uh, somebody somebody asked, will the live stream be available later? Yes, up on in the Facebook group here on LinkedIn and on Twitch. It dies in a couple of that. weeks, but it should be up on our YouTube channel uh, permanently uh, sometime soon. But you should be able to catch it here straight away. Um, but yeah, anyway, I uh, Scott, really appreciate your time. Always a pleasure. Thanks for hanging out with us. Audience, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And Ed, thank you for having me. Um, it's always fun to get to talk about this stuff, and I look forward to seeing you guys in class. Yep. Reach out if you're interested in it. We are happy to take a call. If you have any questions about it, please feel free to ask away. And uh, thank you all for being here, for asking great questions, and for being a part of this community, because you already are. So we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everybody. <laughs>